Next up, we have Becky Larson from the University of Wisconsin. No, Wisconsin. Yeah, yes, yes. University of Wisconsin. All right, and she is going to talk to us about the impact of biochar on nitrogen management. Oops, I totally clicked the wrong button. Switch this. Here we go. All right, thank you. And there is a clicker here if you Thanks. want. Thanks. All right, my name is Becky Larson. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Steve Safferman was my PhD advisor. And now I'm going to present one of my students' PhD works today. Uh, he's not here because his wife is very, very pregnant. She's due this week, so he wouldn't come and talk, which I don't understand. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> but he was nice enough. I put his name first because he made this PowerPoint for me. The funny thing is I told him it needed to be 30 minutes long, so we're going to rush through this because <laughs> I just realized I have 20 minutes. And he was nice enough to give me some slide notes, which he should know me by now that I did not read. So. Uh, anyway, I read his dissertation enough, so we'll get there. All right, so we started working on biochar. Um, I should also mention, besides the two of us, um, another uh, faculty member in my department, my department chair, Troy Rungi, really helps us a lot with the chemistry. And so if you get too many questions for me, you're going to hit the point where I say you can email him. He loves email. So. Um, but, you know, I started working in biochar, and I kept telling Troy I was not going to get super into this. But I guess, you know, rabbit holes, and now I'm in one. Um, so we did a lot of work uh, trying to look at how biochar affected nitrogen cycling. Because the original um, time we started using biochar, we were trying to do some phosphorus management. First, when biochar work started and we realized it really did nothing for that, and surprisingly had some different impacts on nitrogen that we didn't really understand. And I would say there's a ton of literature coming out in this area at the moment, so um, it's interesting to try to stay on top of it. Uh, but biochar is produced from bi biomass, typically using slow pyrolysis. Um, we get the bio oil and the syngas, and then we have this um, biochar structure. Uh, it's known to be aromatic. It has a lot of surface area. Um, it typically has an alkaline pH, and it has a high uh, cation exchange capacity. So when we first did some soil amendment studies and other literature was showing that we had significant reductions in nitrogen leaching when we started introducing biochar into the soils. Now I will warn you, if you ever look at biochar, there are tons of different kinds of biochar and all of their characteristics are really important and you should never really think of any of them as being the same as another one. So um, that's one really important thing that I think in initial biochar we kind of missed, which kind of led us to maybe take some incorrect conclusions away. Um, but regardless, uh, it has been shown to increase crop yields in some cases. I mean, it's back and forth depending upon the type of uh, biochar you're using. Um, and so we decided to look at, we wanted to see why we think we saw some nitrogen leaching reduction, what really are the mechanisms there. Um, and some studies were starting to see some retention of nitrate in the biochar. Um, and so there was a lot of theories out there of why it is that we were seeing that. Uh, one of those was oxidation. One of them was um, or the forming of an organomineral complex that the nitrogen was being formed to. And then unconventional hydrogen bonding. I, my chemistry is not great, but my chemist always tells me that this is just what people say when they can't explain anything else. So I like to pretend that I'm always like, it's hydro uh, unconventional hydrogen bonding. I know it. OK. Uh, so biochar temperature, feedstock, they all have a lot of important things. These are just a few of the things. But you can see, as pyrolysis, temperature increases, so does pH. And then on the other hand, the, uh, the cation exchange capacity is known to decrease as you increase the pyrolysis temperature. But this is just temperature, right? Your feedstocks and some other things that you can kind of affect in the biochar really affect this. So it is really important as we move forward in biochar um, to have some standard characterization that's happened, although it's pretty tough to do. Okay, so in this, I'm going to present you three experiments in my short amount of time, so I might have to go pretty quick. But in this one, we used a lot of different biochars. We had a lot of different oxidation treatments. So we were trying to look at, is oxidation the mechanism by which nitrate is binding to biochar? Um, we did a whole lot of different assessment. I will tell you, when we started this, we didn't start with any of these chemical. Uh, maybe the titration was the only thing we thought we needed to do. And then as you look into biochar, it's really hard to look at the surface characteristics and the chemistry going on. So you add a million different things, and then you kind of get an idea of what's happening. At least that's my interpretation. OK, so when we looked at the uh, biochars, now we had a ton of different treatments, but I'm just going to show you a few of what I think is important. Um, so what we did after we oxidized them, 
Uh, we oxidized them using um, a sodium hypochlorite oxidation. One was modified with a tempo, and then there was another hydrogen peroxide one. But what we found was with the same char, as you increase the amount of um, sodium hypochlorite used in the oxidation, we resulted in more total acid groups, right? More of that re responded and more so. That makes a little bit of sense. Now, when we looked at that tempo addition, which we thought would increase the oxidation, we actually didn't see that, which, which is nice because it's super expensive, but we thought it would increase oxidation further, but it did not. Um, and then when you look at these two different wood biochars, they both oxidize pretty similarly. So we had a, a decent amount of oxidation in both of them as measured by this total acid group content. Um, that's likely because there's a lot of lignin, which turns to phenols, and then those phenols are, are, more, are better oxidized using the procedures that we use for oxidation. Now then we had corn cob as an additional biochar. Um, all of these were produced at around 700 degrees. Um, this one was a little bit lower, likely because these oxidation men didn't have as much lignin, which then the oxidation wasn't as uh, effective. Um, but I will say um, that we had a ton of other treatments and any of the biochars that were produced at like the 400 degree temperature, which have a large cation exchange capacity compared to the 700 ones, they did not, um, result in any, the, the oxidation was really, uh, uh, what is my word I'm looking for? It, it was not successful. We did not see a lot of total acid group content increase. So we did some XPS analysis. The only thing I want to show here is that we could verify that our oxidation was successful. Um, and I, I know I'm moving fast, but you, this paper is already published, so you can take a look at it in the science of the total environment. Um, but then what we found was that that, that those that were oxidized had an increased nitrate sorption capacity, right? And we're talking there was no nitrate absorbed to those that were in the same treatment that weren't oxidized, and then when we oxidized them, they resulted in nitrate sorption using a batch sorption experiments. Um, and so then as you increased, again, the amount of sodium hypochlorite used, we got more nitrate binding. Um, we did not see many differences when it, in terms of that tempo. Um, and then again, it seemed to really be related, right, to that total acid group content, how much of the nitrate was found there. And so we found this kind of connection between the total acid group content and the nitrate sorption capacity. Um, and then the other thing that we found was, because of the slope of that, we were, we, we were thinking, what the heck is happening here, right? This is negatively charged generally, and we have nitrate binding to it, and so the likely theory that we think after all of this analysis is that we have some cation bridging, right? That we have cations that are binding to the, to the biochar and then the nitrate is then binding to those cations. And maybe some unconventional hydrogen bonding, no, just kidding. Okay, so then we did some uh, retention time testing and we looked at as you increase retention time, the nitrate sorption increases, which was really interesting. The likelihood in that is that the oxidation sites probably the oxidation could uh, get into the pores of the biochar and oxidize them, but then it probably took the nitrate a little longer to reach those sites. Is the only logical explanation we could come up with for that. So the second part of this was to do some um, filter strip treatments. Let's see, I'm running out of time here. Um, so in the filter strip designs, we had a uh, biochar, so we had six plots, three of them had biochar amended in the plow layer, so in the first like 15 centimeters. Um, it was at a 2.5% by weight. Now that doesn't seem like a ton, but if you ever use biochar, the density is really low. If you try to get to 5% by weight in soil, it's pretty diff, I mean, you just end up having a ton of biochar in there. Um, we planted this with the native grass mix, did a lot of the classic things for, uh, we followed a specific design for the um, vegetative fi filter strip plot design. We collected all the subsurface effluent and then designed something to catch the surface effluent. We did 20 application events through these systems over the course of a year. Um, so we collected all of the effluent in one way or the other. Um, and it was designed to collect a 25 year, 24 hour storm with a one to run ratio of uh, uh, silage bunker storage area to um, uh, filter strip area. Um, so when we did this, I'm not going to talk about the BOD or COD or total phosphorus or they both all were reduced in the subsurface effluent, but there really wasn't a difference between the biochar treatments and the others. Um, so for time's sake, I'm just going to focus on the nitrogen. So when we looked at the total cumulative nitrogen, um, I, it was a, 
about a 15% reduction. So we had, um, when we inc incorporate the biochar, we had a pretty good reduction in total nitrogen in the subsurface effluent. I will say that the, the design of our system, we had no surface runoff in any of the in any of the trials, even when the weather was pretty cold. I think we ran these from about five degrees Celsius to about 21 degrees Celsius was the range of the temperatures that were targeted. Um, so you can see the form that was applied, there was a lot of organic nitrogen in the runoff, um, a little bit of uh, ammonium, and then that resulted mostly in organic, but a lot of nitrate. And so we, had, we did see a reduction in the cumulative um, nitrate, uh, the cumulative nitrogen leaching. Um, the really important part and what was our targeted thing to try to see was that we wanted to see the impact on nitrate leaching. So there was about a 40% reduction in cumulative nitrate leaching in the system over this period. In the beginning, we really didn't see a lot of it, right? We didn't see a huge impact between the biochar and the other treatment system. Now, we didn't oxidize this, right? We just put this in the soil. And it's likely, and I'll talk about the last um, uh, experiment in a second, it's likely that there was some aging and weathering and some of those mechanisms for removal that were developing along in those first kind of things that happened there. Um, and so then we really started seeing an impact. Um, but even at this level, you can see it kind of really reduces those peaks in the nitrogen and the concentration for the leachate events. Um, but again, some of these concentrations still are very concerning. Uh, but what we found was when we did the mass balance for most of this, while the plants uptake a little more nitrogen, and that was statistically different, the majority of the difference was due to the binding within the soil and biochar surface. And we found that the change in, in nitrogen was mostly in the organic fraction. It wasn't in these other things. You know, in previous studies, people really thought it was binding a lot of ammonium. Uh, we just didn't see that at all. We did see some binding of nitrate, but more binding of organic nitrogen, um, and specifically in that uh, top surface over these. So we were kind of uh, questioning what was going on here, so we, did a, uh, we decided to do a column study where we had different treatments of organic nitrogen. I will say, you know, and every time you design something, you always wish you would have made a change at the end. Um, in the initial ones, we applied only organic nitrogen um, to the columns, and they had the same biochar as we used in the filter strips, right? But it was at a little bit higher percentage, so we were at 5% in the columns. We did 10 applications through this. So in the or ones that received organic nitrogen, we did a low and high application. The low was similar to what we'd see of the effluent from the uh, feed storage, and then the high was more like manure. But then it was like we applied 10 manures at a time, and so that was kind of a little intense, so I wouldn't have done that one. I would have done something a little different. But then ammonia, we did the same thing. And then we did a, only nitrate additions to some controls where we used the same biochar, but we also used the 700 degree and the 700 degree oxidized because we wanted to see how their nitrate uptake responded to that. Okay, so in the organic nitrogen application columns, I'm only gonna talk about the low one because not much happened in the high one because we just kind of overloaded the system. Um, but you can see we had a ton of conversion to nitrate in that system, and there was a reduction in the amount uh, of leaching that we had. But when you look at this, similar to what we saw in the filter strip, the majority of the change is associated um, with the soil, uh, uh, soil's ability to hold on to that organic nitrogen. So we looked at the soil and we said, okay, look at this again. There's a little bit of nitrate being held here, but the total change is mostly represented by that organic nitrogen, right? So when we apply organic nitrogen to the system, the biochar seems to retain a whole lot of that. Um, we did also measure the emissions from this. There were no ammonia emissions really from anything, um, but we did see that there was a reduction in nitrous oxide emissions with the biochar systems, just a note. Not gonna be a huge thing I focus on at the moment because I clearly don't have enough time. But then we looked at the ammonium application. We saw some reduction in the nitrate leaching. When we looked at the mass balance for that, again, there was just a little bit of change, right? So when you apply ammonium, what's happening there? The soil indicated that at that point, the conversion to nitrate and you're getting some nitrate binding, right? And so then we, we did the NO3 application. We saw that not a lot happened, right? So. Oddly, we, the 400 degree char didn't do anything. It actually led to more nitrate leaching, probably from some nitrogen in the biochar. And then we saw that, or in the soil, and then we saw that the 700 degree 
actually outperformed, and I'm sorry that last one should say 700 degree oxidize, outperform the oxidize. Now I told you before, when we oxidize that increased nitrate sorption. Well, it seems like in a soil system, there are some of those other mechanisms. So the organo mineral layer, I'm thinking is playing and we're running some um, XPS results to see if that's what's explaining that here. In the filter strip studies, it looked, the XPS did show that some of those minerals were important. And so it's odd that the weathering or the natural aging process in there might be better than what we can oxidize on our own because there's multiple processes going on. So there's still a few things to investigate, um, but it is interesting uh, what we saw there. So the functional groups, when we looked at the FTIR afterwards, we definitely see that everything was oxid that we saw a lot of oxidation as it was in the soil, even over just these 10 weeks of application, right? The other thing is we can actually measure the nitrate binding. The interesting thing about this is you can see in the ammonium columns, we had nitrate binding, but not in the organic columns. So we're thinking that the organic is binding in a way that might be taking some of those sites up that the nitrate might also be using. And then when you look at these ones, again, you see the same kind of trend, but again, some issues with why aren't we seeing more nitrate binding in the ones that were oxidized. Remember, we used that 400 degree char for some of them, right? That one didn't perform quite as well. But when we look at that retention model, it took about two hours for the, for the flow to go through these columns. And what we were seeing is that in the increased retention time, at about three hours, you're only getting about 10% retention, which is maybe why we didn't see such great performance and that you would need to design a system with a little more retention. Um, so in conclusion, I think the most important things are oxidation does play a role in nitrate absorption. Um, in soil systems though, there's a few other things going on. It seems like probably that organo mineral complex that forms and I, you know, always the unconventional hydrogen bonding. Um, and so I think there's really some capacity here to build this out a little bit as a, I think it is really important that we now have, you know, there's something where we can bind nitrates. There's a lot of places we might be able to use this. Um, again, in, it seemed to perform, remove 40% of the nitrate leaching, um, but Oddly, it really seems to be driven by the organic nitrogen retention in these biochars. And that it also does retain nitrate, but when there's organic nitrogen, that is the primary driver for the reduction of leaching. Okay, thanks very much. I don't know if I have any time for questions. Yeah, All right, look at that. Any, no, yeah. You mentioned you'd done a study previously on deep retention with biochars. Mm -hmm. Um, it really doesn't do anything. We expected it to because of the kind of charge differences, but um, we didn't really see anything. And now I don't I, see the thing is, I think if you looked at it a little bit more, a lot of biochars can be modified either during production or post production. So I think you might be able to modify it possibly to do something. But the chars we looked at had no real impact. The chars we used in this study also had no real impact compared to just the soil's ability to, to remove. Yeah. Yep. Did you uh, look at activated biochar as well as just biochar, or, or were these all activated? These were, these were just biochars. We did not activate them. Instead, we oxidized them using the chemical methods because we. the tough thing is once you start doing things with the biochar, uh, it's really hard to just make one change without other changes happening. That's why we wanted to just test one of the mechanisms using chemical oxidation to see what the impact was. I think a lot, we still need to do a few more studies to really understand individual components so then we can understand how they play together. Like the N2O, it looks like some of the binding of nitrogen reduces the N2O, but also the microbial data seems to show that there's some uh, N2O reducing bacteria that also play a role in it. So uh, there's a whole lot of more picture, I think, to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, Andrew, what uh, environmental conditions do you expect these sources other than sinks? Like oh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that a little bit. So obviously in that last one when there was a lot of nitrate and you didn't have the chars that were aged or weathered properly to absorb the nitrate, then it would lose. But this is pretty stable. So unless you get into an environment where uh, like unless you break down the particle size a lot. So like when we were putting them in the digester, we would break them down and put them in. Um, they would break apart. And so eventually I think you would end up with some of those materials being able to more quickly be available and be lost. 
Um, but as the structure is, it's pretty, it's pretty stable. Um, so, but that is important. We didn't see in any of our leaching studies uh, more losses. We, we always saw reductions in nitrogen except in that last nitrate study. So when you're just applying low levels of nitrate, that was the only time we saw that. Okay, I think right, you're saying you're give, done here, Becky. Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> let's give Rebecca a hand.